everybody to uh, your weekly SETI seminar series. Uh, today we're, uh, we're very lucky to have uh, speaking to us, Kerry Zeitlin. Uh, Kerry is uh, a PI at the Southwest Research Institute uh, and uh, he's a local uh, to the Bay Area. So we're uh, very lucky to have him here today. Uh, he is a board the uh, Marie Mars, uh, Mars Radiation Environment Experiment on Mars Odyssey, which he's going to talk to us about today. Uh, he's a bachelor, bachelor of Science in Physics at uh, UC Berkeley, and then uh, a PhD at uh, UC High Energy Physics. Uh, and he uh, has worked uh, at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Uh, and uh, his career has been uh, looking at high energy physics and cosmic rays and so on, uh, and their effect on, uh, on uh, the human body. And uh, today uh, he's going to talk to us about Mars Odyssey measurement. Indeed, I am going to talk about radiation at Mars. And uh, in April, April of 2001, and, and got to Mars in October, and then was, uh, of course, in the usual highly elliptical orbit that had to be circularized, and that took three months of arrow breaking. And uh, the mapping orbit was established in February of 2002. And the Odyssey science package consisted of three main instruments. There was the gamma ray spectrometer suite, or GRS, the thermal emission imaging system, Themis, uh, which is an IR instrument built by uh, Arizona State, uh, Phil Christensen and MARIE, the Martian Radiation Environment Experiment built by uh, NASA JSC. Initially, Odyssey was supposed to have uh, a lander as well as an orbiter, and it would have been a very interesting experiment to measure the radiation on the surface and simultaneously in orbit, but after the failure of the Mars Polar Lander in uh, <clears throat> 1998, the uh, lander part of the Odyssey mission was, was canceled. Uh, and I should mention that the, um, of the three instruments, uh, Themis is, is still going quite strong and sending back some really great images. So I strongly encourage you to check out their website. Uh, moving to the next slide, uh, the motivation for Marie at that time was to prepare for human exploration, um, which in this case means measure the dose and dose equivalent from galactic cosmic rays and solar particle events at Mars. And at various times, the prospects for human mission to Mars have seen more or less distant. Uh, they seem pretty distant right now, but um, there have been sort of these waves of interest where it seems that uh, we might be going in 20 or 30 years. Uh, so these sort of measurements were somewhat prioritized actually by the, uh, by the human spaceflight part of NASA. Uh, moving to the next slide. Uh, yeah, I can't talk about Marie without mentioning Gautam Badwar, uh, who built Marie and several other spaceflight instruments. And um, that was very unfortunate. Uh, Marie was built, delivered, integrated into uh, the Odyssey spacecraft and on its way to Mars when uh, Gautam suddenly died. Um, and he never got to see it uh, function at Mars. Um, that's where I was called in to uh, take over as PI after Gautam had died. Um, very unfortunate, and he's uh, very much uh, missed by everybody uh, who ever worked with him. He was a he was a very uh, well loved man. Uh, moving on to the next slide, uh, I'll talk for a minute about the the gamma ray spectrometer or GRS suite. Um, and this is this slide is showing the uh, principle uh, of its operation. Basically, the galactic cosmic rays penetrating through the thin Martian atmosphere are the source for the gamma rays that, that are measured uh, in orbit. And the way this works is that the, the cosmic rays come through the atmosphere, they enter into the soil, and they undergo nuclear interactions in the soil. And as this cartoon indicates, there are several different possible results of these interactions. Um, and some of the particles will come back up from the surface. This is called a, a leakage flux of uh, neutrons and gamma rays. And actually the GRS contains neutron detectors as well as the gamma ray detector itself. Um, and you can see that uh, all these kinds of particles come back up, thermal and epithermal neutrons, fast neutrons, and gamma rays. And the interesting thing about them 
is that they tell you something about what the materials are in the surface. In particular, they can um, tell you whether there's hydrogen in large amounts. The, the neutrons are, are quite sensitive to that, uh, particularly the um, comparing the thermal, epithermal and fast neutron, different channels of the neutrons. Um, if there's hydrogen in the material, as in water ice, uh, the initial fast neutrons that are produced in the collisions get moderated down to thermal and epithermal energy. So there's a when the spacecraft flies over these regions that are icy, there's a depletion of the fast neutrons and an increase in the thermal and epithermal neutrons. So it's a it's it's quite a convincing signature. The gamma ray spectrometer itself is actually looking at at various uh, gamma ray lines, including the hydrogen line. And as you can see in the next slide, there is a very clear uh, signature for hydrogen at the poles. This is what they uh, call a, a frost-free map. At any given time, one pole or the other has a CO2 cap, and the signal is not so clear from that uh, pole. But if you look at times when one pole or the other is uncovered and then combine them, you see this is the underlying hydrogen distribution. Now they say H2O, uh, and it, it almost certainly is water and not hydrogen in some other bound form, uh, simply because the concentration is so high, there's no other way to get it. And, and subsequently, uh, as we know, the Phoenix uh, lander landed um, poleward and saw ice uh, quite visibly. I should mention, by the way, talking about Phoenix, that uh, that Phoenix lander actually was the Odyssey lander. That was the piece of hardware that uh, was intended for Odyssey. When NASA canceled the Odyssey lander, they mothballed the, uh, the lander hardware, and then it was eventually reused as Phoenix. Moving on to the next slide. So let me get back to talking about radiation and um, what we experience on Earth compared to what astronauts get in space. And what I'm showing here is uh, the annual average whole body dose that we receive. Um, in the, this is actually average just for the United States. It, it varies a little bit, um, as I'll, I'll, I'll explain more in a minute. And the unit is the millisievert per year. And I will be talking about what a millisievert is. That's a number that you, or a, a, I should say a unit that you've probably um, heard recently in the context of the uh, Japanese nuclear disaster, um, but it's rarely, if ever, defined in the media. So I think it's it's worth talking about just what is a sievert or a millisievert or a microsievert. As you can see uh, from these numbers, uh, the average annual total is 3.6 millisieverts per year, um, <clears throat> and about 8% of that comes from cosmic rays. Now, the cosmic rays that reach us on Earth are not the primary cosmic rays that impinge on the top of the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, those all either stop or undergo interactions and produce secondary particles. And there are long-lived secondary particles, primarily muons, that make it to the surface. And that's what gives us this dose. But the atmosphere is a great shield against cosmic rays. The, the radiation dose you receive above the atmosphere is, is much higher, as we'll see. Uh, continuing on, um, this next slide shows various uh, space missions and uh, and a few terrestrial uh, situations as well. Um, for shuttle missions, which are fairly short and don't tend to go up terribly high, uh, they have some geomagnetic shielding uh, and they are inside the shuttle most of the time. Uh, in a roughly 10-day to two-week trip, they get four millisieverts of a whole body dose. The highest uh, doses on the shuttle have been the Hubble uh, servicing missions where they're at high altitude and they do a lot of EVAs. And so the highest recorded uh, skin dose uh, on a shuttle mission was one of those, and that was 79 millisieverts. And that's quite a bit higher, as you can see, from uh, than, than any of the Apollo missions. Um, but actually Skylab uh, had uh, the highest of, of any low Earth orbit mission. Uh, they were up for a very long time. And you can compare that to, say, what you get from, uh, well, a CT scan. It's quite small. Uh, an airline crew, even with spending many, many hours at altitude, uh, they only get an additional two millisieverts per year. Uh, and if you are contrasting that with what's happening in Japan, they just 
recently raised this limit from 125 to 250 millisieverts for the Fukushima uh, workers. Uh, and we'll see, this is still, this sounds bad. It sounds like a big dose compared to all these other numbers you're seeing. And this is in a relatively short time. Nonetheless, in terms of risk, it's this is not a huge exposure. Um, and then uh, just for uh, contrast, Everything I've shown you so far, except for that very bottom row, is a whole body dose. Uh, if you get radiation therapy for a solid tumor, uh, that's a localized dose, but still your healthy tissues are irradiated and they try to, of course, focus the dose on the tumor. And the tumor uh, typically receives about 70 sieverts, not millisieverts, sieverts. So huge doses. And it doesn't necessarily kill all the cells, even when it's irradiated, because cancer's come back. So um, cells can survive quite a lot of radiation. All right, moving on to the next slide. Okay, so now I want to give you some context as to what um, the various uh, exposures mean in terms of risk. And um, basically the, the, the way we know uh, what radiation does to people uh, as a, a chronic long-term effect uh, is from looking at the uh, A-bomb survivors uh, in Japan and uh, Chernobyl survivors. Um, and what has been learned is that uh, over the course of a lifetime, if you receive one sievert of whole body dose, you have about a 5% excess fatal cancer risk, as they call it. Now, we all have a 30% chance of dying of cancer anyway. So we add that 5%, and now you have a 35% chance instead of 30% after you've gotten one sievert. Um, so this uh, highest dose on the previous slide was 250 millisieverts that a Fukushima uh, worker is allowed, and you can see that that would add something on the order of 1% to that person's excess fatal cancer risk. So um, scary, but not, not a huge deal. Um, now, acute doses are something uh, entirely different. The acute dose is when you receive uh, more than two sieverts in a matter of minutes or a few hours. Uh, and that's what produces the acute radiation sickness that, that you may have uh, heard about or, or uh, seen depicted. Um, you know, vomiting, uh, swelling, just horrible, severe illness that often leads to death, death if the dose is high enough. Um, Okay, but those are not encountered in spaceflight. Uh, the only way that one could get an acute dose is, would be to be out on EVA, uh, far from any sort of shelter, and have an extremely intense solar particle event. And even then, there, there are ways to mitigate it. So very unlikely that anybody in space will ever get an acute radiation dose. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Now, I've used the word dose without defining that. But dose is a purely physical quantity. It is the energy deposited per unit mass. And the SI unit of dose is the gray. Um, and it's a joule per kilogram. And the old unit was the rad. So one gray is 100 rads. Then moving to the next slide, dose equivalent is not a physical quantity or not purely physical. It is also a joule per kilogram. But there's a weighting factor. Um, and uh, as, as with the gray, <clears throat> excuse me, and the, <clears throat> excuse me, the old unit being the rad, the old unit for the uh, dose equivalent was the ram, and a sievert is 100 rams. Um, and it is different from the gray by, because of the weighting factor, and it depends on the type of radiation. So this is an attempt to account for the different biological effectiveness of different radiation types. So for sparsely ionizing types like gamma, gamma rays or uh, electrons, the weighting factor is one. It's five for protons, 20 for alpha particles, and anything heavier than that. And in a mixed field where you might have protons, helium ions, heavier ions, which that sort of describes the galactic cosmic rays, you have, you have this mixed field um, way of calculating the dose equivalent in which the weighting factor is replaced by what's called the quality factor, Q of L. And in the next slide, uh, I'm going to show you Q of L. Okay, you can see that here. Um, it is purely a function of the LET, which stands for linear energy transfer of the particle that's uh, depositing energy uh, and giving dose. And you can see that it peaks um, 
up around 100 keV per micron. Now, the uh, I'm going to show you in a minute. This is based on various biological data, and it has some uncertainty. But one thing to note about this, the iron ions, the high-energy iron ions in the galactic cosmic rays, fall very their LET falls very near the peak of this quality factor distribution. So we're going to we're going to come back to that point. The way it's used in health physics, dose is the integral of the fluence phi over the LET spectrum. And the quality, average quality factor is a dose weighted integral. It's actually sort of the second moment. And then the dose equivalent is that average quality factor times the dose. And what you see, uh, sorry, phi, phi is the fluence. It's the number of particles per square centimeter of a given LET. Now, this is probably, uh, this is actually a somewhat controversial thing. This is the recipe for how people calculate dose equivalent. Dose equivalent is what tells you the cancer risk. And you can say, well, this is just probably fraught with problems. And indeed, it is, because you've compressed all of biology into a single variable, L. And it's probably not right, but it's sort of the best thing we have right now. And this is what ultimately is used in risk estimation. <coughs> Um, and let me show you some of the data uh, that tell you where Q of L come from. So lots of biology experiments have been done with different particles to try and get at this. And RBE stands for relative biological effectiveness. So you take a dose of your whatever radiation you're studying and you expose your cells or your animals to that. And you take the same dose of, say, gamma radiation, where we know that the RBE is 1.00 by definition, and you do that same experiment. And then you take the ratio of the effect. And that's the RBE. But what you see as a function of the LET, there's a great deal of scatter in these data. They're all over the place. And the attempt to draw a line through it for quality factor is, is some sort of really gross averaging. Um, but it's not at all clear that this really is a precise enough uh, method to, to give us the information that we, we need. And not only that, if you look at the different types of experiments that are done, it's not clear what's the right experiment. What's the right endpoint, biological endpoint, to measure in an experiment like this that's going to let you therefore predict cancer in a person? Now, that's, quite, that's quite a leap, uh, as is the whole idea that you simply expose some cells and see what happens to the cells and then you know what's going to happen to the person. Um, this is a very complicated problem, and, and it goes to the, the very essence of carcinogenesis, uh, which, of course, is not very well understood. So somehow, NASA, in trying to protect its astronauts from life-threatening risks, has to fold this in to how they limit exposures to astronauts in, in space missions. Now. Um, I haven't shown you why this is true yet, but I will in a moment. But the galactic cosmic rays, the GCR, include a high percentage of particles that are very, very penetrating. And you cannot build a spacecraft that has enough shielding. Well, you can build it, but you can't launch it. <laughs> because launch costs are prohibitive. So you, as a practical matter, cannot build a spacecraft that would effectively shield against the galactic cosmic rays. They're just too energetic. They'll just zip through the walls of the spacecraft and expose the people inside. So therefore, you have a situation where you cannot avoid these exposures to heavy ions. Now, we're on the surface of the Earth. I told you all the galactic cosmic rays that hit the top of the atmosphere uh, interact and create secondary particles. And the radiation we get on the surface has nothing to do with those cosmic rays that hit the top. I mean, only that they generated it. But there, it's different. We get mostly muons. What's hitting in space are a mix, protons, helium ions, heavier ions. And it's these heavy ions that you can't, well, you can't avoid any of it, but you cannot avoid some dose of heavy ions. And life on Earth simply did not evolve to deal with heavy ion damage to DNA. Uh, if you look at uh, DNA repair, well, here's, here's sort of this cartoon showing you an x-ray going through DNA, and it causes damage, and it breaks the strand. OK, this is what you would call a single strand break. DNA is miraculous stuff. It knows how to repair itself. So you do that to a DNA, it'll fix it. 
and it'll fix it correctly. It knows what to do. But you give it something like this, and again, remembering that life didn't evolve in the presence of, of these sort of uh, heavily ionizing particles. <clears throat> and you have a complex cluster of damage. And the DNA may or may not know what to do with that. Now, if it doesn't know what to do with it, and it misrepairs it in some completely messed up way, the cell will die. And that is fine. That's actually what you want. You don't, you don't want a messed up cell to live and propagate. The problem is if the DNA repairs itself kind of, sort of, but it's actually misrepaired. It's not repaired correctly. That's a potentially mutagenic cell. That's a cell that can go on and cause cancer. And this, I should say, is not very well understood exactly. Um, what the misrepair frequency is and what the consequences are of misrepair. So I told you I would explain why the galactic cosmic rays can't be shielded. Um, and this is a famous plot from uh, Simpson from University of Chicago, um, largely using data taken 30 years ago, but nothing much has changed uh, as in this aspect of it. This is the kinetic energy of the ion in MeV per uh, AMU and the flux. And up here, the highest curve, that's hydrogen. Those are protons. Below that are the helium ions. And then carbon and iron are shown. But all ions uh, in the periodic chart are actually present to uh, some extent. But these are uh, some of the ones that are most important. Hydrogen, helium, uh, actually carbon, nitrogen, oxygen are all about equally important. Uh, and iron, for reasons that I will explain in a minute. Um, and if you look at this, of course, you say, well, this is a log scale. It's almost all protons. It's 90% protons. Why are you worried about these heavy ions? Because there are so few of them. Uh, and in fact, it's sort of 90% hydrogen and about 8 or 9% helium. So the really heavy stuff is only about 1%. But I'm going to show you why that's important. And it's also worth noting that the intensity of the cosmic rays, and we call them galactic because they're coming from outside the solar system. Um, there, the sun itself is a source. But the, the uh, solar uh, activity modulates the intensity, and it particularly modulates the intensity at the low end of the energy. But these energies, if you notice the scale going out here to 10 to the 7th MeV, really anything above about 10 to the 3 is very, very penetrating. So a lot of the flux is, is quite penetrating and will easily get through the walls of a, a, any practical spacecraft you can think about building. Now, if you integrate over energy just to get abundance by species, so this here abundance is plotted, again, a log scale against the nuclear charge. And this is the Badwar O'Neill model. I told you that Gautam did a lot <laughs> in this field. And creation of this model was really one of uh, his great accomplishments with uh, Pat O'Neill. And Pat actually keeps updating the model and improving it. This is quite a good, accurate model of the galactic cosmic ray flux. As it, and they're able to um, predict it at various times in the solar cycle. So what you see, again, just completely dominated by the protons and the heavy ions not adding up to much. But the dose gives you a different picture. So what I've done here is to take that abundance and you weight it by the charge squared. And the reason you do that is that that basically is the LET of the particles proportional to the charge squared. So these things that are way down in abundance start to become significant. And if you remember the quality factor plot I showed you that was peaking at an LET of about 100, and then I had an arrow saying this is where the galactic cosmic ray iron is. It's at a very high quality factor. This is what happens if you plot dose equivalent, where that quality factor is folded in. Look, look what happened to the protons. They're, they're down an order of magnitude. The helium is way down. And what has popped up is the iron. So for something that has a tiny abundance, when you look at it in terms of dose equivalent, it's extremely important. And these other ion species are also very important. So this is something that NASA actually has to be concerned about, the exposure to these particles, even though, as I'm going to show you, the doses are quite modest. The other thing that NASA has to be concerned about are solar particle events. And I've just stolen some SOHO images here because I think they look really cool. Um, <coughs> But solar particle events, uh, as you probably have heard, uh, are potentially hazardous to astronauts. The sun can accelerate particles to significant energies, tens or hundreds of MeV. 
And these particles can <coughs> penetrate small amounts of matter. So if you're in a really thinly shielded spacecraft, or worst case really is that you're out doing some sort of an EVA and you have only your spacesuit to protect you, that's not going to stop the solar particles. Whereas a couple of inches of aluminum in your spacecraft hull probably will stop them. But the EVA situation is, is kind of precarious. And, and in fact, even the Apollo spacecraft that went to the moon uh, were pretty darn thin in the hull and would not have stopped a lot of uh, solar particles. Um, so a little bit of shielding does, does help, sort of knocks down the doses. Uh, but there have been some very large events observed that would have uh, made astronauts quite sick if they were exposed, uh, say, going to the moon or on the surface of the moon walking around and one of these events hit. Unfortunately, the events also tend to ramp up so you have time. They don't just sort of instantly turn on. There tends to be a few hours where the, the flux of the solar particles is coming up and, and people can run and hide, basically. There was a, a well-known paper a few years ago that posed the question, is there time to hide? And the answer is usually yes. Nonetheless, NASA has to worry about that. So what does NASA do about radiation exposures to the astronauts? Well, currently, for low Earth orbit, LEO, um, the administrative limit is that exposures have to be such that there's no more than a 3% increase in this cancer, lifetime fatal cancer risk that I talked about earlier. And it's not just that you have a point value of 3%. You have to, it has to be within the 95% confidence interval. Or remember all that biology data that I showed you that's scattered all over the place. Well, that affects this confidence interval because how well do we know that risk? And there's quite an active program actually going on within NASA or funded by NASA uh, at it, the Brookhaven National Lab. Uh, there's a dedicated accelerator uh, that's uh, doing radiation biology just to try and knock these risks, risk estimates down, the, the uncertainties down, um, because they are so large. So it's, it's a really actually a very good investment for NASA to reduce uncertainty by understanding biology better as opposed to trying to launch some <laughs> extraordinarily massive spaceship or to uh, more likely limit mission durations to the point where you can't do the sort of missions that you want to do because you're running up against the accumulated dose limit. So this, this is a plot uh, from uh, Frank Cucinata at JSC and he actually sort of runs the uh, radiation uh, program down there for the astronauts. And these are the point values. So I've plotted the excess uh, fatal cancer risk here and uh, various missions. This is the lunar sortie envisioned a few years ago. Um, ISS, they're up there for a long time. It's not that ISS has a particularly high dose rate on it. It doesn't, but they go up for six months at a time. So they accumulate a bit. And then a Mars mission, which puts you, if you just took the point value, you're right already at this 3% administrative limit. But now you put the uncertainties on. And the uncertainties are huge. And it says, well, maybe we really can't do a Mars mission right now. If, even if we had all the will in the world to do it, this 95% confidence interval would stop us from doing it. OK. Yeah? Has anybody asked the actual astronauts who would go on a Mars mission? <laughs> Right. I mean, that's that's a good good question. Yes. And well, uh, look. You, you know, I mean, I, I don't know if you were following this a few months ago. The Journal of Cosmology published this uh, issue, and among other things, suggested a one-way mission was a possibility. And people signed up. Yeah, hundreds of people wrote in to say, "I would go on a one-way mission." So yeah, astronauts are a risk-taking cohort. There's there's no doubt. But they they're not allowed to make the choice. It's not. It's not up to them. At least this part of it is not up to them. They're taking lots of other risks too, obviously. And so you have to say, well, why would you worry about a 3% risk when you got a 20% risk that the rocket's going to blow up or something <laughs> won't, won't work? Yeah, it's not really 20%, but you get, you get my drift. They have lots of risks. Um, but this is one that's administratively controlled. So what, what does the radiation look like in Mars? Well, this is a calculation, uh, again, from JSC. Um, on the surface of Mars. And it's just the galactic cosmic rays. There's no attempt to put in any solar particle events here. Uh, and 
it's assumed that there's just a column depth average of 16 grams per square centimeter, and then the molar altimeter data were used to get the altitudes. And so your dose is simply a function of altitude. And if you remember from some of the early slides I showed, the cosmic ray dose at the surface of Earth was something like, on average, 0.29 millisieverts per year. Well, on Mars, it's 0.25, well, 0.2 to 0.3. It's in this range. But that's not millisieverts anymore. That's sieverts. So it's a 1,000 times higher. OK. And if you remember, we said the one sievert was 5% increased lifetime cancer risk. Um, so if you think about a, the 1,000-day mission, which is sort of the nominal profile, where you spend about uh, 250 days going, 500 days on the surface, another 250 coming back, you're going to be up against a sievert. So it's right, it's right in that place where um, you say it, it's right up against the limit. Now, something about that atmosphere, a couple things to notice here. The, um, from the highest to the lowest point on Mars, there's a 50% difference in the, the dose equivalent. It's not a huge difference. It tells you that the atmosphere doesn't really do that much. This is the same, this is the shielding problem I was talking about earlier, in a way, if you think about it. The atmosphere is acting as a shield, but it's only knocking the dose down, you know, by a third in the best case. And that shielding, by the way, is enough to stop most solar particles. That's, that's an important point. When the solar particles come, the protons are not energetic enough to get through that 16 grams per square centimeter of column depth. Um, but they will uh, generate neutrons, and the neutrons can make it down. So that's one of the things we're going to measure in the next experiment that I'll tell you about eventually. Um, so getting back to Odyssey, I know I detoured a long way off from talking about Odyssey. But uh, Odyssey included Marie. Marie's a kind of a standard silicon telescope used to measure charged particles. Um, so actually, detectors A1 and A2 were the most uh, useful for this. And then there were these uh, thicker detectors and some position sensitive detectors that, that we didn't actually end up using much in the analysis. And what, what silicon detectors do with energetic charged particles is they measure the deposit of energy in silicon, of course. Um, but this can be directly related to dose, because the dose, if you remember, is deposited energy in water. So you just have to translate between silicon and water. And I'm just going to show you, just, this is just um, raw data, uh, taking, taking a look at the scattered plot of two detectors in what you see. And this is a quiet day in August of 2002. And then the next day, you start to see this. And these are solar particles. That, and then they go away. <laughs> So that was a little teeny tiny solar particle event. And that's, that's just sort of how the raw data look and let you know that there's, there's something coming in. And just to show you again, the, these extra lines you get in this plot, these are the low energy protons that come in and uh, stop actually in the second detector. OK, so looking at a sort of bigger picture, um, I mentioned that there was a gamma ray spectrometer and the neutron detector. Well, it turns out they're all sensitive to cosmic rays. I mean, that's sort of the whole point of the, the gamma ray measurement and the neutron measurement is that you're getting these cosmic rays that hit the surface and give you stuff splashing back up that you detect in orbit. But the input to that is the cosmic rays. And the gamma ray spectrometer in particular uh, was a very large crystal. It had to be big because there's not a lot of gammas coming back. And you have to have a large area to detect a, a signal with some efficiency. Um, but when, when a cosmic ray hits that detector directly, it creates a huge signal, much, much larger signal than the gamma rays that they're looking for. So they're not interested in those. They don't care about those. I mean, it would potentially be a great cosmic ray detector, but they don't care. That's not what they're looking for. So what they do is they, they just count them. They gate them out. They don't analyze those events, but they count them. And that counter turned out to be really uh, a very useful thing. So Marie, with its because it's designed to be a particle detector, and these other instruments weren't, but they, they have the sensitivity sort of by accident. It's very useful for us. Um, Marie counted protons above 16 MeV. Now, 16 MeV is about what it would take to get through a space suit if an astronaut's out on EVA, and that's their only protection. Um, and then the A2 channel in Marie had a 27 MeV threshold. And the HAND, which is the Russian high energy neutron detector, uh, the data from HAND actually tracked pretty well with that. So 
you can say it's got roughly that same threshold. And the GRS um, had a somewhat higher threshold at 42 MeV. And what I'm showing here are the data from 2002. And you see there's a sort of baseline that everybody sees. So here it's the gamma ray spectrometer, this upper level discriminator that counts the proton and cosmic ray hits directly. It's called the ULB and the Marie A1. And the Marie was more sensitive, so it's got a little bit higher flux all the time. Uh, also had some outages that uh, I'll tell you about. Um, but you see these little solar events and then a big one and then quiet, a few more little ones and then a big one. But the things are, are roughly tracking each other. They're seeing, they're seeing the same things. And the, the, uh, the hand instrument also seen more or less the same things. But Marie, of course, had the best sensitivity uh, during the solar particle events because it had this lower threshold. So it would see the largest increases. And this is, this is somewhat typical. This is a zoom in on a really actually quite a piddly little event. Um, and you see the other channels registering almost nothing but the, that A1, that most sensitive channel, um, uh, getting uh, you know, somewhat, somewhat more sizable event. And out here during these quiet times, you can take the quiet time data and make an estimate of what is the total galactic cosmic ray flux. And the units of flux are particles per square centimeter per stir radian per second. And it's a lot easier just to say PFU. So a PFU is a one per square centimeter per stir per second. <coughs> um, and so GRS, if we apply all the normalization that we think we understand of that instrument, we get 0.12. Marie gave 0.15. And then so we sort of split the difference and said HEND had no sort of intrinsic normalization. There's no easy way to normalize it because it's such an indirect measurement of the neutrons. And so we just arbitrarily normalized by splitting the difference. And sometime later, I, I found that there was BESS data. BESS was a balloon-borne uh, spectrometer that, uh, that flew around the same time. And BESS found 0.16 for the same thing. So we're pretty, pretty much in the ballpark. And you don't expect that the cosmic rays are very different between Earth and Mars. What's different are the solar particle events. The cosmic rays are, are, um, have a very, very gentle radial gradient. They're increasing as you go out in the solar system, but the difference between 1 AU and 1.5 AU is not enough to really see any difference in the cosmic ray flux. So this was the first big um, solar particle event that we saw in July of 02. Um, and you can see, again, Marie's got the best sensitivity, uh, but also had these coverage gaps. And this was a commanding issue where uh, Murray would acquire data and uh, then transmit data to the spacecraft and they turned it off while it transmitted and then they wouldn't turn it back on. Thanks a lot, guys. <laughs> so we got that sorted out eventually, but at first we had these, these kind of spotty uh, coverages. <coughs> it's unfortunate, but we did, we did get it squared away. Um, and then in October of 2002, there was a sequence of three events and one of the things that um, what we use these data for is trying to understand what HAND is doing because, as I said, it's measuring the neutrons coming back off the surface, except during a solar particle event. What happens is the spacecraft itself is bombarded with protons, and those protons create neutrons coming off the spacecraft, and HAND was picking those up, of course. I mean, it, it, HAND can't tell where the neutrons are coming from. And they have a correction for that during the solar quiet times. We, we know how much of the neutron flux is coming from the spacecraft, and that's subtracted out. So when you look at regular hand data, you're only looking at the neutrons from the surface. You've subtracted out that spacecraft background. But during a solar particle event, there's, there's no attempt to subtract that out. And in fact, most of the neutrons are coming from the spacecraft. So it's, it's a very indirect measurement of the solar particle flux. Um, so it's hard to figure out what exactly it's telling us here. If you look at the red and the black lines on this, the red is the, the GRS, and we know what that threshold was. And, and it has very high statistics, so that's why it really looks like a line while everything else is sort of scattering around and got some real finite width to it. Um, and HEND in that first event is tracking it, and the second event is tracking it, and the third event it looks completely different. So this is a bit of a challenge to understand what, what HEND is telling us on, on these solar events. And one way to look at it, uh, and the reason for looking at it this way uh, I'll come to in a minute, if we look at the ratio of our A1 and A2 counter in Marie, um, if that ratio is large, that means that A1 is the thing on top. It's hit a lot more than the thing beneath it that's a little bit shielded. So that means it was a very soft event if there are a lot of protons hitting A1 that don't 
penetrate far enough to get to A2. Whereas on the other hand, if they're more sort of equal and you're down in here, then you've got a, a relatively hard spectrum in the event, more high energy protons uh, than in a typical event. And M Marie, I'm going to explain to you, Marie stopped operating in late 2003. Um, and so what we were left with after that was just the, uh, this hand channel and the GRS channel. And so the question was, could we correlate the ratio in those two detectors versus what we saw in Marie? And the answer was, not really. You get these clusters. There's sort of three clusters here. So it almost looks like, well, OK, so if you're, if you're up here, maybe that means you had a hard event. And if you're over here, you certainly had a soft event. But the hard events also have this down here. So it's very hard to interpret that. So this was an attempt to see what we could get out of the non-Marie data as far as characterizing the solar particle events. Uh, and it's unfortunately not very good. Um, so what happened in late 2003, and this was admittedly an embarrassment, is that there was a huge solar particle event and Marie stopped operating after it was hit by this. So the radiation instrument was knocked out by radiation. <laughs> oh dear. You can imagine I didn't have such a wonderful time trying to explain that to people. Um, <clears throat> but indeed what happened was there was a small event around day 300 and here all the detectors are seen as just seems like a fairly normal event. And then this huge event comes along and actually the Marie data stopped here. Although Marie was still operating out here, we were never able to get the data down. And you now the spacecraft at Mars just communicate with Earth a few times a day. They're not in constant contact or anything. And at a certain point on day 301, um, there was contact with a DNS station. And the operator saw that Marie had a temperature alarm, so they turned it off. It never came back on. It was very unfortunate. There's nothing else. It's not the operator's fault, obviously, nothing they could do. But um, you know, little did we know that commanding it off at that time meant it was never going to come back on. And the temperature alarm was probably something like the DC to DC converter um, failing from the radiation. Other instruments went on. And however, of course, shortly thereafter, Odyssey itself went into safe mode. Um, because obviously it had some kind of an upset in its computer and it, it knows to go into safe mode and, and stop taking science data. So we were not actually able to record this data even in the uh, hand which you see up here uh, and the GRS. Now the reason there's this huge disparity, there's two orders of magnitude between what hand was seen and what GRS was seen as this event really got going. And the reason for that is that the GRS simply was saturating. It couldn't count the number of particles it was seen and hand could, hand did not saturate. So this was the profile that Hen saw, and it was huge, just huge event. And this event went on for days and days. <coughs> um, and it is known, I mean, it's sort of in the lore as the Halloween 2003 event. Um, now, there's another, was at that time, another spacecraft at Mars, that, that Mars uh, Global Surveyor, MGS, and that had the uh, magnetometer electron reflectometer experiment on board, and that actually had some sensitivity to charged particles. And that did record the rest of the event. So sort of able to make some guesses as to what the total dose was from that. So after Marie was uh, no longer operating, uh, we nonetheless continued uh, doing this uh, radiation monitoring in 2004, 2005, all the way up to 2008. And what you see is there's not a lot happening. That, that 2003 Halloween event was the last big event of that solar cycle and everything quieted down after that. You got a few little minor events happening, you know, really small events in 04 and 05. Uh, actually, this January 05 event was, was pretty big at Earth, but um, I probably should have explained this, but didn't. The connection between the Sun and the Earth is not necessarily, and in fact mostly isn't, the same as the magnetic connection between the Sun and Mars. So they can see completely different things during solar events. So this was actually a poorly connected event at Mars, but a well-connected event at Earth. And it was so well-connected, actually, that they told the astronauts in the ISS to go and take shelter for a few hours because it was a huge energetic particle event, at least as seen here. And in 2006, what you see is that this, it's all galactic cosmic rays here. There was one little event in December. But in 2006, the galactic cosmic rays started ramping up. And this was, this was the effect of the solar cycle. This is the modulation I mentioned earlier. So all the way out, 2002, 3, 4, 5, the galactic cosmic rays were suppressed. 
we had a very active uh, period uh, with the sun before that, and then we went into this deep minimum, which we're sort of still just coming out of, um, far behind schedule, actually, on the 11-year cycle. <coughs> so you see the cosmic rays, the galactic cosmic rays jumped up about a factor of two. And there was this one event. This is very, very late in the cycle. This is really a time when uh, it's solar minimum. But nonetheless, we had a significant solar event in December of 2006. And Hind saw quite a large event compared to GRS. Oh, and I should add, GRS, GRS um, was designed to be annealed periodically, especially after a safe mode event. Um, it's a high purity germanium crystal, and that has some properties that where it accumulates radiation damage, but you don't see it until it warms up. But every time Odyssey would go into safe mode, GRS, the spacecraft would reorient itself, and GRS would warm up. And then all of a sudden, you see the radiation damage that had accumulated over the previous months. <coughs> so they, they knew that this would happen, and they had a way to anneal it by cooking it, basically, to high temperature. So they would bring it in and cook it, and then send it back out, and it would work. And it, I think it was built to withstand you know, five cycles of that, something like that is what they expected. And it ended up, it, it withstood quite a, quite a bit more than that. I think it withstood something closer to 10 cycles. But finally, after one of those cycles, the GRS failed. But HEND is still going on, and Odyssey is still going. So there's actually a potential to get more, more data out of it. And this is, this is the long time scale picture. This is sort of six years at Mars watching the galactic cosmic rays. And the thing to look at here is the red, which is the GRS. Um, <clears throat> and I'll tell you why the hand is not so reliable for this. But you see that, that this is the 2003 Halloween event where things jumped up. And actually, in the wake of that, and this is, this is a well-known effect, there's something called a Forbush decrease, which is the, basically the rearrangement of the magnetic fields in the heliosphere is such that it prevents some of the galactic cosmic rays coming in. So there's often a little decrease after a solar event. And that was a big Forbush decrease because that 2003, that Halloween event was so huge. But then the, the galactic cosmic rays start coming back up and sort of work their way up. And by 2006, they were, they were double what they had been, and they, they stayed there. The reason HEND doesn't work so well for this, HEND, because it's measuring the neutrons, and these are neutrons off the surface, uh, it's sensitive to seasonal effects. And what you see are these dips that occur uh, once a Mars year. So that limits the utility of, of hand as the GCR monitor. And this is our catalog of solar events recorded over, over the life of the mission. There's actually nothing after 2006. I looked at data out through 2008. Um, but it was really concentrated up here. And the big, the big events were that July event, and then, of course, the Halloween event. And October 2002 was also a fair-sized event. <coughs> so how does this get back to what we were uh, starting out with, which is the dose and dose rate. Well, this is, this is the, and I have to admit, there's some little bit of hand waving in here to go from the Marie data. Um, they need basically a lot of correction to get the full dose equivalent rate. But um, with that caveat, this is, this is what Marie saw in Mars orbit. And in the blue, the blue bars are what was seen on the ISS during the same time. Now, ISS is inside the Earth's magnetosphere, so it's somewhat shielded by that. And it's also got a lot of shielding of its own. It's thick compared to most spacecraft because it's got a lot of equipment racks and so on, and those actually provide shielding. <coughs> um, and so you see roughly two to two and a half times as much dose in Mars orbit. And what you see, even though um, we had these fairly big solar events, this is July 2002 that I talked about a few times, and Halloween events not included in here. Um, but that was a very soft event. Now, these soft events, lots of protons, but they're all low energy. They, they would be stopped by shielding. So they don't have a big effect on the dose equivalent. Um, <coughs> but even when we had big events, it, it was not a huge impact on dose equivalent. And, and this, is, this is sort of in an unshielded environment. So um, <coughs> it's sort of 20, 30, 40 percent from the solar events. Now, if you were on the surface of Mars, it would be probably even less because of that atmospheric shielding. But the surface environment in general is more complex than the atmospheric, uh, or than the 
environment at the top of the atmosphere, I should say, because of the atmospheric shielding and also because of this penetration effect. If you remember, the whole point of the GRS and the neutron measurements is they're looking at the stuff, basically, they call it a leakage flux of neutrons and gamma rays coming out of the surface. Well, those things, especially the neutrons, contribute to the dose at the surface. And they could be 30, 40, 50 percent are kind of the current estimates is due to the, of the dose equivalent at the surface is due to the leakage. So on the next Mars rover, which is the Mars Science Laboratory that they've now christened Curiosity, um, there is a radiation instrument, RAD, uh, radiation assessment device. It's a, it's a very small instrument. It's one and a half kilograms. Um, but it is uh, very, I'm working on it, so I'm prejudiced. But I think it's a very clever uh, job of packaging. And it's a very capable detector. And it, it will um, measure the neutrons at the surface, which hasn't been done. The neutrons were measured in orbit. You've got the atmosphere to attenuate them. You have to make some corrections. And furthermore, people weren't really looking for the dose from those. They were just not doing absolute normalizations at all, <coughs> um, rather just looking for changes in the flux as the spacecraft orbits. Um, so I don't know how much people know about MSL, but this is a heck of a thing. Uh, the entry, descent, and landing, because it's so large, it's the size of a Mini Cooper. Uh, compared to the rovers that have uh, <coughs> landed previously, it's huge. So it's got this, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but it's an extremely complex EDL. Um, and if it works, it will be just amazing. And the end, and yeah, a lot of work has gone into this. They think it's going to work. They're really highly confident it will work. So we'll all be watching with uh, crossed fingers and bated breath. Um, but in the end, what happens is basically there's this power descent, and at the end it hovers and is lowered down on the sky crane. And then the cables are cut, and the rest of the spacecraft flies away. It would be very exciting, <laughs> if not very uh, nerve wracking, yes. Um, and one little sort of a goof of a thing that I thought I would throw in here is that uh, people sometimes think about interstellar travel, and you know, there's a lot of science fiction, obviously, about going close to the speed of light. Um, but one thing you don't generally hear about is what would happen, what sort of radiation would you encounter? Well, I've been talking about energetic particles where the particle had all the energy. But it doesn't really matter if you're in a spacecraft that's going near the speed of light and there's a particle sitting there. It's the same as if you're sitting there and the particle has, has the energy, right? It's no difference. So if you think about what's in the interstellar medium, uh, it's about uh, one hydrogen atom or one proton per cubic centimeter. Um, and these will pass through the walls of a spacecraft, if you, especially if you get it sort of up to a velocity of 0.8 or 0.9 the speed of light. They'll just pass right through. It, spacecraft walls won't, won't do anything to that. And if you calculate what that dose rate is, it's four gray a second. Right, instantly. <laughs> so this was uh, just something that, you know, Something to think about. If, if there's intelligent life out there and they have figured out how to do interstellar travel, then they have figured out how to solve this problem. <laughs> and that was all I had. Uh, thank you again for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. And thank you for your attention. Kerry, can I uh, ask the first question? And sure. Uh, what about uh, the possibility of deflecting charged ions? How Magnetic. Shielding? Yeah. How yeah. advanced are we in, in understanding that and, and how much of the uh, right. GCR does that, that That's That's a very good question. Thank you for asking that. I should have said something about it, actually. Um, this is something that has been studied a bit. Um, but at this point, our ability, well, again, you have to remember the galactic cosmic rays in particular are extremely energetic. And magnetic fields will not sufficiently deflect the high energy ones. And the mass and the energy required uh, to create the magnetic field, you need to actually deflect enough galactic cosmic rays is uh, more than just bulk shielding of non-magnetic material. You're actually better off with bulk material at this point. Now, maybe technology will advance and we'll be able to generate gigantic magnetic fields at lower mass. But right now, the technology is not there. This is going to the extreme, I guess, but there are cosmic rays that are up around 
10 to the 20th uh, right. amount of bolts. <laughs> What, if, what would happen if, say, one of those came into somebody's body and about an inch inside slammed directly into an oxygen uh, nucleus? What yeah. would occur right, right after that? Right. It, it, well, I mean, fortunately, the flux of those is so low that that's an extremely improbable event. But if were that to happen, yes, what, it, what happens, part of the dose is what they call target fragments. So what that means is you've got this particle coming in and slams into uh, a a nucleus of an atom in your body, and it blasts that thing apart. And depending on how much energy is transferred to that nucleus, um, you can have quite a bit of dose just from that. Okay. And so you, it, it's very localized. Right. What, what happens is you, you transfer maybe a few MeV to these particles. Um, and, but those few MeV particles actually have very high LET. It's very localized, but the cells right nearby could actually get a heavy dose from that. Now, this is one of the things that's not really accounted for in the standard way of, of doing the risk estimation or the dose calculations. But, it, but, it, but it's a real effect. Yeah, yeah, sure. In fact, it's been measured somewhat on station. The target fragments are estimated to contribute something like 10% of the dose equivalent. And that's just from particles passing through you know, aluminum or other junk that's on the spacecraft and making these low energy particles. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious about the ratio of um, heavy particle um, emission from interstellar versus the sun. What is the oh, ratio? Oh, during the solar particle events, th there are rare events in which heavy particles are accelerated, but they're very rare. A typical uh, solar event is 99% uh, protons. But from space, what, any heavy particle emissions coming in from space that are common? In, 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 the, in the galactic cosmic rays, there's about this total of 1% of charge 3 and above. Okay, and what is the heaviest po heavy particle been detected? Well, everything in the that periodic chart. At 92? Uh, I can't say I know that for sure. I know there's been detection of lead at 89. So, okay. um, yeah, above iron, the spectrum drops off steeply. And this is be no doubt because of the fusion cycle, which commonly ends at iron. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, how good is a few inches of fuel for shielding? Ah. I mean, this would be that probably... A, depends on the fuel. Your I know, nitrogen tetroxide and yes. symmetrical That's hydrazine. Uh, excellent question. Anything with hydrogen. Now, this is, this is the funny thing about this very energetic particle radiation that you encounter in space. Now, you go to the dentist or, or you go for a medical x-ray and They'll, they'll give you a little lead apron or whatever, yeah. right, at the dentist. And the x-ray technician, while they're shooting the x-ray, they'll go stand behind a, a lead wall, right? Yeah. Lead is the worst thing you would want in space for shielding. Mm -hmm. Hydrogen, it turns out, is the most effective shield. So fuel containing a lot of hydrogen is, in fact, an excellent shield. And so people have thought about, well, you design the spacecraft so that the, the, the fuel is the shielding. It, it is... Uh, <coughs> Mm -hmm. uh, put in tanks essentially that surround the, the uh, inhabited areas yeah. of the spacecraft. Of course, then you don't have so much on the way back. You're using it up as you go. <laughs> but hydrogenous materials in general are mm -hmm. the good shielding materials. And yeah. we've done a lot of ground research that validated that. And then if you dug into a moon of Mars, you would mm -hmm. assume you wouldn't have to go very deep to be well shielded. You have to go fairly deep. Uh, you're talking about like on Phobos or yeah, Deimos? Yeah, Phobos or Deimos. Actually, the best thing you could do, I, is it Phobos that has the uh, gigantic crater on the side that faces Mars? Mm. That crater, Stig Stigny, is that? Stigny. Yeah, Stigny itself is a good shield. If you're down deep in a crater, you know, one thing I didn't, I probably should have said, but I didn't, the galactic cosmic rays come from 4 pi. They're coming isotropically all over. If you're on the surface of a planet, just being on the surface, you've gained a factor of two of shielding because now half the sky is blocked. And if you're down deep in a crater, so much the better. Now you've only got some opening window through which the particles can come through. So just being down in that, in that crater would be helpful. And yes, people talk about build, building habitats a few meters down. Now what happens is, the problem is, these particles are so energetic, their secondaries are also somewhat energetic, and you create a lot of neutrons. And the neutrons are biologically damaging. So you can't completely get away from it, but sure, things get better if you go down a few meters. <laughs>
What sort of um, increase in data are you going to get from the alpha magnet spectrometer that's going up on the next uh, shuttle? Uh, that's, a, that's also a good question. Um, th they're, of course, they're looking for antimatter with that. Um, and I'm not sure what sort of data products are going to be available um, uh, that would pertain to this. They're, they're going to see everything. So it should, bless you, it should be possible to extract from their data uh, some good information on the, on the cosmic rays. There's also the Pamela experiment is kind of similar. It's a smaller version of AMS that the Italians have flown. Uh, and so that data is also available. So uh, given that I'm understanding your talk correctly, that solar particle emissions, you have a few hours notice and they can last Usually. for days. Yes. Uh, so if yes. you have uh, a Mars or Moon uh, mission and they have a rover and mm -hmm. the astronauts are more than a few hours yep. away from the base, yes. I, I assume that that's a potential problem. It, it is and what indeed. What kind of pl planning goes into that? Yeah, that is indeed a problem. Uh, in fact, one of the one of the projects that I've uh, been working on a little bit is uh, was inspired by just that problem. Uh, it's called the EVA dosimeter. So the idea is that, and this was um, in response to the lunar sortie. Uh, idea that, that we were going back to the moon and do Apollo-type missions, um, but longer duration, including roving quite some distance from a base. And so, yes, you don't want to be caught out. And so we were building, and we're still building because that's how the time scale of these things go. We're still building an instrument for a mission that no longer exists. But <laughs> we're building this alarming dosimeter. When the dose gets high, it, you know, it lets the astronauts know, and it's supposed to go in their backpack. Um, so yes, that's a problem, and people think about how to provide some kind of shelter on a rover. That's a difficult problem. I've got, <clears throat> I've got two questions. First, why are hydrogenous materials such good shields? And secondly, what about the medical records of all the astronauts? How do they correlate with the expectations, or the, with yeah. projections made from them? Excellent, excellent mm -hmm. questions. The, the reason hydrogenous materials are uh, good shields um, is nuclear physics. And it's, it, without going into a lot of detail, let me just say, hydrogen is really good. This heavy ion radiation, the ions themselves can be broken up into lighter ions that are less biologically damaging. And hydrogen is very effective per unit mass at doing that. It's per unit mass, right? It's also very good. It's, it's got very high stopping power. So it stops particles well also. So the lower energy stuff stops in a very short distance in hydrogen or a hydrogenous material compared to you know, lead or something. That was, that was the first part. Um, the, medical the medical records, of course, um, the astronaut cohort is small. And many of the exposures uh, are, are quite small. So it's almost impossible to get anything out of that. I will say that there has been one, and I'm trying to remember if there was a second instance of this, or may have been a second instance, where someone was prohibited from flying because it was felt they had accumulated too much dose. And that's a, that's a real loss for NASA because they put in a lot of time and money into training each astronaut. So if you have someone who runs up against their career limit and they can't fly anymore, even though every other reason says they can, it's, it's really, really not good. My question was really, yeah. Well, that's, that's where the cohort being so small comes into play. You, you can't, just can't tell on a statistical basis. Remember, we, and I, I wouldn't venture to go into what the rate of cancer deaths is among the astronauts, but remember, we all have a 30% chance of dying anyway. The one thing I will say that has been seen is, are cataracts. Now, cataracts are a marker for radiation exposure. And I had a friend who worked in this business who said, he would close his talks by saying, he was a cataract expert, he said, I hope you all live long enough to get cataracts because they're an in inevitable byproduct of aging. Um, but what's seen in the astronaut cohort is a little earlier onset of cataracts. It's not dramatic. Okay, I'm going to encourage everyone who has further questions to please come up and be the, see the speaker after the talk. Yeah, sorry I ran long. No, 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 that's, that's fantastic. If you all, um, oh, he's a, a steady mark. <laughs> Thank uh, you very much. It's a little better than the plastic uh, we oh, gave you great. there at the Actually, start. Actually, it's beautiful. So Thank you. Please join me in, in thanking Carrie for his great speech.